Today, we are going to be discussing why many good, strong, fundamentally sound poker players lose at cash games. It is because they completely neglect bankroll management. But bankroll management is vital to long-term success. In order to win at poker, you only have to do three things. Shouldn't be that hard to do three things, should it? First, you have to find a game you can beat. A lot of players can do that. All you have to do is find really bad players to play with, or you have to get really, really good at poker strategy. Then, number two, you have to play that game a lot. You have to put your butt in the chair and grind. A lot of players are good at that. But they forget the third part. Number three, you have to keep a proper bankroll. It really is that simple, but almost no one does all three. And a lot of players who are very good at poker forget to keep a proper bankroll. And because of that, they lose. Understand that you will inevitably experience variance when you play poker. Even if you have a large edge, sometimes you will lose. So you have to keep enough money on hand to withstand the inevitable swings of the game. And this essentially requires you to have money, a bankroll, set aside that is exclusively used to play poker. This implies you do not spend that money on anything else. Your bankroll is not an ATM. This, of course, does presume that you have an edge. If you do not have an edge, if you have not found a game you can beat, well, you're going to lose. No amount of bankroll management can save someone who consistently plays in a game where they lack an edge. So make sure you know how to play poker well. If you want a whole lot of poker strategy, check out PokerCoaching.com. Here are bankroll cash game requirements. Presuming you're playing No Limit Texas Hold'em, using a style that is not incredibly high variance. If you're playing a game with more variance, such as Pot Limit Omaha, in that game, you're going to need a bigger bankroll. You're going to have a bigger swings in Pot Limit Omaha than in No, Lim no Limit Hold'em, typically. If you play loose and aggressive and insane, if you're triple barreling it all in all the time, you're going to need a bigger bankroll. If you're kind of tight and aggressive, you may need a slightly smaller bankroll. These are the bankroll requirements for No Limit Hold'em cash games, assuming you play normally enough based on how much you win per 100 hands. Now, how do you know how much you win per 100 hands? You keep track of your results, but let's go through this very quickly. If you win three big blinds per 100 hands, which is not actually that big of a win rate, this is going to be if you're playing tough online games, you're going to need 10,000 big blinds in your bankroll, assuming you want to have roughly a 3% risk of ruin, which means you're not going to go broke all that often. If you have 10,000 big blinds in your bankroll and you have a three big blind per 100 hand win rate. If you're playing 100 big blind buy-in games, this is 100 buy-ins. If you're playing one to no limit online with a tiny edge, you need $20,000 in your bankroll. That may sound like a lot, and it is a lot. And most people don't keep anywhere near that amount. Most people actually overestimate their skill edge and... They keep way too little money. It's a recipe for disaster. If you are a good, very, very good online player, you're probably winning something like seven big blinds per 100 hands, and you're going to need about 6,000 big blinds or 60 buy-ins if you're playing 100 big blind games. Also worth noting, perhaps if you're playing deeper stacked games, maybe you need slightly more buy-ins. Maybe if you're playing shallower stacked games, maybe a little less. It depends. It depends on the variance that is part of the game because as you play against specific opponents, maybe they make the game crazy. If the game's crazy, you need more buy-ins, right? Or more big blinds. If you are a good, strong, live crusher, you're probably winning 20 big blinds per 100 hands or so. In that case, you're going to need roughly 2,500 big blinds, which is not that much. 25 buy-ins. It may sound like a lot, but really it's not. That is almost nothing. Back when I used to grind five 10 no limit hold'em at Bellagio every single day, 12 hours a day, I would win, I would win roughly $100 per hour. And we would play something like 30 hands per hour, which means we're, I'm somewhere in this vicinity, right? 
And I really never had much of a downswing at all. My biggest downswing was something like 15,000 bucks, which is not a lot. And I was winning about $30,000 each month because I had a big edge, I was playing a ton, and I had a very substantial bankroll. Like I mentioned, this gives you a small risk of ruin. If you cannot add more money to your bankroll because you are a professional poker player and that is all, you do not have a job, you probably want to have lower than 3% risk of ruin. You want to never go broke. I personally always kept far more money in my bankroll than was required because going broke would be a disaster for me. Now, that does mean potentially you're giving up some edge by playing higher stakes games, but I think it's usually worth it. If you plan to move down aggressively, as soon as things start to go poorly, perhaps you can keep fewer buy-ins or fewer big blinds than is required. Imagine as, let's say we are playing with a 20 big blind per 100 hand win rate, and we have 2,500 big blinds. If you know if you get down to 1,500 big blinds, you're going to move down, essentially doubling your bankroll, right? Because now you have 3,000 big blinds at the smaller game. You can perhaps keep a smaller bankroll because by doubling your bankroll by moving down in terms of big blinds, that makes it very, very difficult to go broke. As you move up, when you start trying to play higher stakes games, understand that your win rate will decrease. A lot of players think they win, let's say, 20 big blinds per 100 hands live at, let's say, 2-5 no limit. When they move to 5-10, they expect to keep the same win rate, but you will not. When you move up, you will inevitably play against better players. As you're playing against better players, your win rate is going to go down. As your opponents play well, your win rate goes down because you're not extracting any value from those players, right? So understand that if you win 20 big blinds per 100 hands at 2-5, maybe you only win 12 big blinds per 100 hands at 5-10. Maybe you win zero. That's tough to say, right? So you need to make sure that you play a decent amount and that you keep diligent track of your results. You can do this using um, iPhone apps that will keep track of your results. Also, you can just use a spreadsheet. I just have a simple Excel spreadsheet that I use where I write how many hours I played, where I played, when I played, and uh, how much I won or lost. That'll give you your hourly rate at specific times of days at specific venues, right? And that will be very, very useful. If you don't know how much you are winning or losing, then you do not know your required bankroll. And you need to know your required bankroll. That is one of the three things you have to do to win. When you are in the process of moving up in stakes or trying to grow your bankroll, I strongly recommend that you do not cash out. A lot of players love the idea of going to play poker, winning a bunch of money, and spending it on something cool. But they're trading a short-term reward for long-term success. Back whenever I was a tiny stakes poker player, I used to play a small buy-in local home game. Every time I would win, I would take my winnings and put it in a box. There was one other really good player where I lived. Every time he would win, he would go buy a new CD. A CD, for those youngins out there, is this shiny disc that you put into a device and it plays music. That's what he did with his winnings. After about six months of this, he had a lot of CDs. And I had a lot of money. And he did not make it as a professional poker player, despite being very good at poker, because he spent all of his money on CDs. He never had the opportunity to move up with an adequate bankroll. Let's consider two players. Both players are equally skilled, okay? They both play 1-2, and they want to move to 2-4. They both have $10,000 to start. Let's say one of these players cashes out $600 each month, and the other cashes out $200 each month. Now, if you have expenses in your life, obviously you're going to have to cash out money to pay your expenses. You need to be aware of this if you're trying to be a pro, right? This is what actually happens to a lot of pros. They do a great job of growing their bankroll when they have no expenses, but whenever they start spending money out of their bankroll each month, it becomes a whole lot harder to move up in stakes, right? If it takes the player, it takes out $600 one year to get to $20,000. Well, that, that is roughly how long it will take them, assuming they have a reasonable edge. In that same one year, the $200 cash outer, the player who cashes out $200, will end up with $46,800. By cashing out $400 less each month, this player, who only cashes out 200 each month, 
has more than double the money at the end of the year. How in the world does that happen? Well, it happens because first things first, you just add more money to your bankroll and you move up quicker, right? But then once you move up, assuming your win rate stays roughly the same, which maybe it will, maybe it won't. We discussed that earlier. If your win rate stays the same, you're going to essentially double the amount of money you make per hour. And if you can double the amount of money you make per hour just by moving up to twice as high as stakes, well, that's obviously fantastic, right? And realize that edges compound over time. A lot of world-class poker players you know today, many of them that are the top players in the world, they started with almost no money. I started with $50, a $50 deposit a long time ago. I never had to reload. I never went broke. never went anywhere near broke. And that's because I learned a long, long, long time ago, it's not fun to go broke. Some people think going broke is a badge of honor, that all good players go broke all the time. No, they don't. I have a group of close friends. None of us have been anywhere near broke. A lot of the best players in the world have been nowhere near broke. And you should strive to grow your bankroll in a sound, logical manner that ensures long-term success. If you're consistently out of action because you play too big, well, you're not making any money. If your butt is not in the chair and you are not playing, you do not make money. So do your best to grow your bankroll as fast as you reasonably can because the faster you grow it today, the more money you're gonna have tomorrow to play bigger games where you're gonna make even more money. We should make this clear, but you need to ensure you have an edge. Remember, you have to find a game you can beat. It is vitally important. It is vitally important if you are not winning in your game. If you're not one of the biggest winners in your game, probably not going to be all that profitable of a spot for you. So how do you ensure you have an edge? Well, first things first, you need to sit at the best table in the room. How do you sit at the best table in the room? Say you go into the casino and you know you want to play one to no limit and you know your casino has five tables of one to no limit. Maybe one of them is a must move game. You have to go there first. Okay. You put your name on the list and you get in your game. Ideally, you show up when there's no list or you call ahead of time and know when you're going to have a seat because if you're sitting around waiting to get in a game, you're not making any money. Once you get in the game and you're at a must-move table, let's say, they're going to make you stay at that must-move table for an hour or so. You have to sit at that table until people at other tables break and then you're going to get moved to one of the main games. There'll be four main games, let's, let's just say, in your casino. One of these tables is almost certainly going to be better than the others. And I say better, meaning the players at that table are going to be worse than the players at the other tables. So as soon as you get to your table, you let the floor person know that you would like to be on the table change list. Most casinos have a floor person who manages this table change list. And if a seat becomes available at another table, they will ask people on that list if they want to move to that seat. Now, you're not going to know as soon as you sit down most of the time if that seat is better than the seat that you're currently in. But while you're playing in the game you get moved to, you're going to want to pay attention to if people are giving away their money as quickly as they can at your table. If they are, great. Stay on the list. But whenever it comes time for you to move to a different table, just don't go. Say, no thanks, I'm going to stay here. You can even say, roll me, which means put you on the bottom of the list in case another seat comes available, which you should do. If your game is not very good, perhaps everyone there plays pretty well, or the game is very tight and passive, and you don't think you're winning all that much money, Assuming you know nothing about the other table, you should probably move. Because if you're playing at a weak, tight game where no one's really putting money on the line, you just can't have that big of a win rate. While you are playing at your table, ideally though, you're doing your best to pay attention to some extent to the other tables. When you are under the gun or in second position, get up go, and go take a look at the other tables. Usually they'll be right near you anyway. And you'll hopefully have some idea of if the pots at the other tables are very big and players are in there gambling. Ideally, if everyone's throwing a party and the table is loud and everyone's laughing and having a good time, usually that's the sign of a game you want to be in. If everyone's wearing sunglasses and hoodies, that's probably not going to be a good game to be in. So you want to make sure you are in the best table in the room of your stake. Next, once you get to the table that you're happy at, or when you're at any table to begin with, you want to make sure you sit at the best seat. What makes this one seat better than the other? Well, Ideally, you want the bad players on your right. And if they can't be on your direct right, you usually want them on your left. You want them near you. And that's because you win or lose money 
to the players next to you more often than the players across from you, right? Because typically, if the player to your right raises, you're going to be somewhat inclined to play with them. Because if they raise the button, you're going to be in the blinds, you're probably going to play. If they raise the cutoff, you're going to be in the button, you're probably going to play. If they raise under the gun, and you're in the small blind, you're probably not going to play, right? If they raise middle position, you're in the small blind or the big blind, whatever, you're not going to play all that often, right? So you want to be seated near the bad players, and ideally you want the bad players on your right, because chips flow to the left in No Limit Texas Hold'em. So ideally you're at the best table in the room, and you get the best seat in the room, which is the seat in the best table. The best seat in the best table at the room. Uh, when you do go to your table, you should ask to be on the seat change list. If they have that at your casino, sometimes they give you a seat change button, which means if you have this button, you get the first priority to move to a seat if it becomes available. Um, sometimes it's just based on seniority, who's been at the table long enough, where if, if someone gets up at your table, they'll say, all right, who wants to move to this table? And then you'll all figure out who is there the longest, and whoever's been long there the longest gets to move to that seat first if they feel inclined. Now, when you do move to a seat to have position on the bad players, you probably don't want to announce to the table, hey, I'm taking this seat because I think this player's bad. Don't do that. Just move to the seat. And then if they ask why you're moving to the seat, give them some excuse. The excuse can be, I want to watch that TV that's right over there. Actually, right over there, and I need this over there to go see it, right? Whatever. Say, if you're at the ends of the table, say you can't see the cards very well, so you want to sit at the middle. If you're in the middle, say you don't like sitting in the middle because you got to turn your head to see everybody. So you want to sit on the ends. Whatever, right? Come up with an easy excuse. Life's going to be fine. You do want to make a point to somewhat actively change seats. A lot of players go to the casino, they sit down, and they literally never move. And that is a disaster. They take a random seat. But you will have a humongous win rate if you actively get the best seat in the best game in, your, in the room. And if for whatever reason you cannot get a profitable seat, it's usually best to quit. A lot of players don't like this. One year during the World Series of Poker, I would go to my favorite casino and I would sit down in the cash games and they would be terribly tough. Okay, fine. I would usually wait a little while to see if the game gets better. I would scope out games of different stakes, maybe play a little bit bigger, maybe play a little bit smaller. None of the games were good. So what do you do? You sit there and play in games that are not good? If the game's not good, you may win two big blinds per 100 hands, like nothing, right? So if you're going to win nothing, should you play? Well, if you are playing purely for experience, sure. But during hectic times like major tournament series, you don't want to sit around playing for experience because you'd rather be resting and recuperating because you have to play lots more tournaments the next day. So I would just not play. And you should not play. I do realize a lot of people play poker because they want to test their skills or they want to push the boundaries. But look, you win money by playing against players who are really bad at poker. And if your opponents are all really good at poker, you're not going to win any money. So you're just essentially squandering your time. You do get some experience, but you're not winning any money. Today, we're talking about growing your bankroll. You grow your bankroll by playing in games where you have an edge. Let's discuss moving up in stakes. It is fine to play one stake higher than your normal game when the game should be especially soft, which are usually going to be on nights and weekends. Or perhaps, if you know, there are a few players in the game of a higher stake than yours who are especially terrible at poker. If you play at the same casino on a regular basis, you probably know the players who are especially bad. And if you play, let's say, 2-5, and they want to play 5-10, it's probably okay to play 5-10. Because essentially, what's happening is if we go over here to this chart, say you normally win at, like, I don't know, 16 big blinds per 100 hands, if these players are especially bad, and your assessment of them is correct, your win rate is going to jump up, maybe to like 25 big blinds per 100 hands. And you see, the required bankroll is substantially smaller, right? So if the required bankroll is substantially smaller, because your edge at this particular table is going to be through the roof, and very, very high, then that allows you to play in bigger games. Now, people are going to take this uh, over the edge. They're going to think that, all right, I know this player is bad, so I'm going to win all the money. I'm going to go play 2550 when I normally play 510. That's a mistake. You do not want to play substantially higher. You want to play a little bit higher. And when you are 
taking a shot at a higher game, you want to be kind of cautious with this shot that you are taking. So what I recommend is you partition a small portion of your bankroll for taking shots. Let's say you normally have, um, let's say you have $7,000 in your bankroll and you're a one, two, no limit hold'em player. So you have 35 buy-ins. Maybe you think you only need 20 because you know from playing a lot that you win at that win rate, right? Let's say we're over here. We have 3,500 big blinds. Let's say we know we only actually need 2,500 big blinds. Well, in this scenario, perhaps you want to partition 400 or 500 big blinds to play a bigger game, which will give you four buy-ins or so to play a bigger game. So say you play one, two, maybe you give yourself $2,000 to go play two, five. If you lose your $2,000, fine. Be disciplined and move back down. Now, obviously, you're going to go on a four buy and downswing a decent amount of the time, but if you do still have a very large edge at 2.5, quite often you will not need to move back down. And then you can just continue playing with double the win rate or even more than double if you're going from 1.2 to 2.5. But you have to be disciplined and move back down. Playing with a short bankroll is playing with fire to some extent. But if the game is super soft, either because they're really bad players or maybe it's nights and weekends and everyone's looking to gamble, it quite often does make sense to play a little bit bigger but you must be disciplined and move back down if your shots fail. Also, when you are taking a shot, when you are playing bigger, don't play scared. A lot of people let the money get to them and they end up playing weak, tight, passive poker. And that's not what you need to do. You need to play absolutely normally, which does mean you are going to lose four buy-ins sometimes and you are going to have to move back down. Speaking of moving down in general, if you want to ensure longevity, when you get down to 50% of the required bankroll or less, it's probably smart to start moving down. And that's going to be especially true when the game is more difficult than normal, which is usually going to be the middle of the day on weekdays. This will give up a little bit of your edge, your potential win rate, but you ensure longevity. Longevity is vitally important to professional poker players because if you are out of action, you don't make money. If you cannot play because you are out of money, you're not extracting any value. A lot of players hate the idea of moving down because now it looks like they are a failure. They get in their mind that they're a 2-5 player. They play 2-5 for, let's say, three or four months. They do okay, but then they go on a big downswing to the point that they need to move back down to ensure longevity. A lot of them do not do it. And they don't do it because they don't want their 2-5 peers to see them playing 1-2 because they'll think, why is he playing 1-2? He must be broke. He must be bad at poker. Get all these concerns out of your head. It does not matter what people think about you at the end of the day. You need to ensure your long-term success. Don't worry about if random dude at the 2-5 game thinks you're not that good at poker. If anything, they're going to realize you have an immense amount of discipline and you will do what is required to ensure long-term longevity in poker. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people move from 1-2 to 2-5 to 5-10 kind of quickly. Maybe they're going on a bit of a heater. They're getting lucky in a lot of spots, whatever. And maybe they're taking shots at 5-10 with 2,000 big blinds. Well, imagine they lose 500 of them. They should probably move down. But they don't because they're 5-10 players now. They keep playing 5-10. They lose a little bit more. They're down to a thousand big blinds. Now they think, well, I got to try to win my money back. Let me go play 1020. Next thing you know, they're playing 1020 with five buy-ins. And uh, well, you're going to go on five buy down, five buy-in downswings kind of often, especially if you're only adequately skilled to beat, let's say, two five. That's what happens to a lot of players. They move up too fast. They think they're better than they are. They lose whatever edge they did have, and they don't have the proper bankroll, and then they are absolutely doomed. Your ego will crush you. Your ego is not your amigo. Let's talk about the rake. Cash game rake crushes most players. More rake is not better. More rake is very, very bad for poker players. It is difficult to beat a 10% rake capped at three big blinds, which actually isn't all that much in a lot of small stakes games. Consider your casino where you play one, two, no limit hold'em. Do they take $6 out of each pot? They probably do at some places. And if that's the rake, you're going to have a tough time winning because they're raking away a ton. So you want to find a way to to pay proportionally less rake. You want to pay as little rake as possible. And you can do this in a few ways. 
Consider a one-two game capped at $4 rake. You'll often find this in Las Vegas versus a 2-5 game capped at $4, which you can also find at Las Vegas and a lot of the major casinos. If you win at eight big blinds per hour before the rake, which is a nice healthy win rate, at 1-2, you'll win $16 per hour minus roughly $10 in rake, which means you're making $6 per hour out the door. $6 per hour out the door is not very good money. Consider 2-5 though. There you'll make $40 per hour minus the $14 rake, which is now $26 per hour. So you have the same win rate in both games, which may or may not be the case. You usually win a little bit less at the bigger game, but you see you're winning four times as much money at 2-5 compared to 1-2. Whereas you would logically think you're only gonna win twice as much money or 2.5 times as much money at 2-5 compared to 1-2. And that's because the rake is less meaningful. As you move up to 510, a lot of casinos take some amount of money per half hour. They'll take $8 per half hour or $10 per half hour. And notice, that's not a whole lot more than you'll be playing at uh, 25, paying at 25, right? So as you play 510, you're paying almost the same rate that you would pay at 25, but now your win rate is even substantially bigger to the point you can make $100 per hour, right? So by moving up in most games, you're gonna make a lot more money if your win rate does not decrease substantially. Again, as you play against better players, your win rate will decrease some. The question is how much? Also, I know some of you are gonna be playing in games that rake a ton. Say you're playing one, two, and they rake $10 per hand, or you're playing a game that rakes 5% of the pot uncapped. In games like that, the way you win is by playing super duper tightly. Super duper tightly. Why is that? It's because when you play lots of pots, you are paying some portion of that rake. And if they're taking a bunch of rake out of every pot and you're paying some portion of it, that's just money that gets depleted from your bankroll. If you only play, let's say one pot per hour, but you win, let's say $50 in that pot every time or whatever, two thirds of the time because you wait for the nuts, in that scenario, you are paying only, let's say, for a $10 rake or $15 rake. But if you win $50 and you pay $15, well, that's still a pretty good deal. You make $35, right? So if you don't play very many pots, you end up not paying the rake all that often. And if you don't pay the rake, then the rake becomes way less meaningful. That said, sitting there and playing super duper tight is not a whole lot of fun. But if you care about winning at poker, you have to not care so much about having the most fun and getting your gamble on, right? We're trying to win poker at the end of the day. There are various other forms of rake that you may not consider. First things first, travel expenses. If you have to travel any amount of time to go to the casino, you should account for that. Most people have to drive 20 minutes to the casino or an hour or longer, or maybe you have to fly across the country. That takes time. And that time is, well, not, not being used to do other beneficial things a lot of the time, at least not to make money, right? Also, it costs money to go places. You have to get an Uber or fly in an airplane or pay for gas, pay for your car, right? These expenses matter and they should come out of your win rate or you should at least consider them. Definitely worth noting, if you are traveling to play poker, try to make good use of that time. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Uh, maybe listen to audiobooks that make you smarter or listen to podcasts or... If you have to wait to get into a poker game, maybe maybe read an educational book. You know, make good use of your time. Don't just sit around doing nothing. So many people squander so much time and you know they wonder why they're not getting anywhere. It's because they're not making good use of their resources. Next, if you go to a casino, you often have to pay for expensive food, right? A lot of time casinos charge more for food than you would spend for food sitting at home. Um, lodging, if you're traveling, you gotta pay for the hotel. Hotel rooms cost a decent amount of money. That should come out of your win rate. So many small stakes players win, let's say $10 per hour, one to no limit. They go to the casino, they know they're gonna play 20 hours. They're gonna be playing a lot over the course of two days. They go there, they play, they win 200 bucks, but they have to spend 100 bucks on the hotel. And they have to spend $20 on transportation. And they have to spend $20 on food. So now they won $200, but they have to spend $140 to make that $200. So they're only making 60 bucks out the door for two days of long work. 
Not a good deal. Again, this comes from the point of view that we are trying to be big winning poker players, right? We're not trying to play to pass the time. We're not trying to play to break even. We are trying to win lots of money. And winning $60 in 20 hours of work is not a good deal. And that's actually not such a bad a bad uh, win rate at 1-2, right? Which is why, again, you need to move up ASAP, assuming you are properly bankrolled. Uh, next, tipping. Nobody likes to talk about tipping, but consider that 1-2 player we were talking about a minute ago. Let's say we have this 1-2 player winning 8 big blinds per hour before rake, okay? $16 per hour they're winning, minus $10 rake means they're making $6 per hour. What if they play four pots each hour that they win and they tip the dealer $1 each time? Only $1 each time. Well, now they're making $2 per hour. It's not a very good win rate. What if they tip the dealer $2 each hand? Well, now they're losing. They've gone from winning, crushing their opponents for $16 before the rake and tips to now losing money. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you cannot tip much money in small stakes games if you want to win. And that's unfortunate. It is very unfortunate that the casinos do not pay their employees an adequate living wage to the point that they have to depend on people giving away large chunks of their win rate. It's a disaster. Because either now, the dealer's not going to make any money, or you're not going to make any money. And, well, it's up to you to choose. And if you're trying to grow your bankroll to ensure long-term success, you can't give away a large chunk of your money. You just can't do it. I'm sorry, you cannot do it. So you can figure out ways to tip in various ways. Maybe you tip a dollar in the big pots. Definitely don't tip if you just win the blinds, right? If you raise to $7 preflop and everybody folds and you win $3, you can't give away one of it. That's literally 33% rake. I've seen some players at some casinos, it's one, two, they'll raise, everybody will fold. The casino will take a dollar for the bad beat jackpot. And then they'll tip a dollar. So now they won one dollar. They tipped away 67% of the pot. You absolutely can't do that. <laughs> so anyway, look, tipping tipping is a rough issue. I get it. I, am a, I do my best to be a very, very generous tipper. And to be fair, once you start winning a lot of money from poker, if you win $100 per hour and you tip out $15 per hour, it's not that big of a deal, right? But if you're winning... $8 per hour or $15 per hour and you tip out $15 per hour, now you're winning $0. Okay? Sorry, but it's true. Next, bad beat jackpots and other jackpots if the casino rakes for them. I mentioned the bad beat jackpots. At a lot of small stakes games, they will take a dollar out of every pot. Sometimes whether or not there's even any action in the pot. And this money goes to a player who at some point in the future, at some table besides yours or maybe at yours, they get unlucky and they make something like a full house, a good full house, and they lose to a better hand. Or maybe they get four of a kind and they lose to a better hand. Make sure you understand the rules of your bad beat jackpot at your local casino. Usually you have to use both cards in your hand and usually it's like four twos has to lose. Okay? Make sure you understand the rules. You're going to be very disappointed when you make a straight flush when there's four cards to it on the board and you beat quads and you... Can there be four cards on the board? Yeah. And you beat quads and you don't get paid. So anyway, these bad beat jackpots are a disaster because you essentially never collect that money back. I realize every once in a while you will. I've won zero bad beat jackpots in my entire life and I paid in some amount of money to them. So understand that these jackpots are essentially other forms of rake that every once in a while you get paid back, but don't count on it. Treat this money as completely lost money. Also... At a lot of casinos, whenever they pay out the bad beat jackpot, so let's say all the players pay in a dollar, they all pay in a dollar, 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 they get up to $100,000. Somebody hits it. When they go to pay out that bad beat jackpot, they may only pay out $90,000 of it, taking 10% as an administration fee. Thanks. Thanks for taking the money and holding on to it and then giving it to just a few people and taking 10%. What a deal. We're so glad we did this, right? Bad beat jackpots are absolutely terrible for good players, because remember, if you're playing in games that have kind of a high rake, you're supposed to play kind of tight. If you're playing kind of tight, you're not going to play the 5-4 suited or the 5-3 suited or the 6-2 suited, hands that can make some straight flushes, right? But your weak, splashy, terrible opponents will, which is why you crush them at the games. 
But those players who play the 6-2 suited are going to hit the bad beat jackpot far more often than players who don't because they get way more shots at it, right? And so if you're a good, strong winning player, you are not going to win the bad beat jackpot proportionally as often as the bad players, which is also really bad for you. So if you're a good player, you're now paying more rake than other people on each individual pot because you are not going to collect back that jackpot money. There are other forms of jackpots some casinos run. Um, sometimes they take money out of the pot from them. Sometimes they do not. Some casinos do like every half hour, the, the highest hand gets $100 or something like that. Sometimes they take a rake for this. Sometimes they don't. And a lot of casinos, you can actually opt out of the bad beat jackpot. Maybe you individually can't, but your table can. And this very often happens at high stakes games because they realize we're playing tight aggressive poker here. We're not going to hit the jackpot, right? If your casino lumps in the limit hold'em bad beat jackpot with a no limit hold'em bad beat jackpot, you're drawn dead because limit hold'em players get to the river far more often than no limit hold'em players do, just based on the way the game works. So if your table can opt out of the bad beat jackpot, you should try your best to make that happen because you're just going to save a ton of money. So that's rake. What about rake back? Rake back is money that the casino gives back to you in various forms. Online casinos give frequent player points or perhaps just straight cash back to the players, which is great. If you are a player who plays a lot of volume on even some of the major sites, they'll give you half of your money back in the form of bonuses or just straight cash or tournament entries or television sets, all sorts of stuff like that. So make sure you collect your frequent player points. And quite often, it makes sense to play at the same venue, online site or live, in order to maximize that. Because imagine you could either get, well, let's imagine you're going to play, let's say, 40 hours a week, and you know you have the same win rate at lots of casinos. You don't really care which one you play at. I mean, you're playing at the softest one, right? So you don't care which one you play at. And if a casino will give you 50% of your rake back, or they'll all give you, let's say, 10% of your rake back. You'd rather get 50% of your rake back than 10% of your rake back, right? It will add up to a lot in the long run. Um, live, there also will be some jackpots that you do not have to pay into. That is usually a slightly better time to play. Usually people are trying to get that high hand every 30 minutes or whatever, right? If you don't have to pay into those jackpots because they don't take any rake out of the pot for it, good. Um, and I mentioned here again, you know, play at the same casino that rewards loyalty because that's just going to give you substantially more rake back. In live casinos, they do this in various forms. Sometimes they'll have a leaderboard for the players who like play the most each month at the casino and they'll just pay out straight cash or tournament entries or something like that. Sometimes they have an end of the month free roll. Maybe it's worth a lot of money. Maybe it's worth a little. You got to figure that out. Say it's a $10,000 free roll. We get to play the monthly 10K. But if there's 100 people in it, it's only worth 100 bucks. You have to play 160 hours to get $100. It's not actually a whole lot of rake back. So anyway, try to get bonuses. Take whatever the casino will give you. Some casinos, if you're traveling, will give you a discounted or free hotel rate. Some casinos will give you free food. Ask the floor person. See what they can do. Here is a typical winning cash game player's graph. This is what it will look like if you track all of your hands individually. This was done using Poker Tracker, or you can use Hold'em Manager or a few other programs online. Live, you can just track each session. It won't be so jagged like this, but it will look something like this. So what does this graph show? This graph showed this player winning. I know it's a little bit tiny. This player won $58,000 over the course of 68,000 hands. Okay, this was actually 23 days of play. It's a lot of play in 23 days. Playing mostly 3, 6, and 5, 10 online. Okay, notice the graph basically goes from one corner right up to the top. What a beautiful straight up graph. Well, take a second and try to extrapolate this to live poker. This is a player who does not actually have that high of a win rate. They're winning at seven big blinds per hundred, which I already said is actually a really good online win rate. But that translates to about, what, three big blinds per hour of live play because you play way fewer hands per hour live than you do online. This many hands live will take you roughly 2,000 hours, which is roughly one year of play if you play 40 hours a week. This is an entire year of live poker for a, you know, smallish winning poker player. Still a very beautiful graph. Can't complain, right? Notice though, 
that this player broke even from roughly right here to right here, which is about half of the time on this graph. Half of the time on this graph, this player roughly broke even. Could you play half of a year and break even? Most people can't play half a year and break even. Most people after half of a year of breaking even, they go nuts. They get mad, they get frustrated, they think the game's rigged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to realize that if you are playing with a small edge, inevitably you will have swings. And that is okay, that is expected. I mean, notice here, this player went from, what is this, $32,000 down to $26,000. $8,000 swing, down. 8,000 up, 8,000 down, 8,000 up, 8,000 down, 8,000. It's like zigzaggy, right? And that is normal. That is not abnormal. That is regular, common, standard. Okay? Do not let the inevitable swings of the game get you down. Sometimes you're on hot, sometimes you're not. And this is actually a nice relatively tame graph. They, they, they get a whole lot crazier than this, especially if you're playing a high variance style. Let's also discuss how much to buy in for. We discussed this earlier, but chips flow to the left on average. So you wanna have more chips than the players on your right. So if this player here has $1,000, this is my right. I want to have $1,000 because I want to be able to win all that player's money. If this player to the left has $20,000 and this player to the right has $1,000, I should buy in for $1,000, not $20,000. Even if this player to my left is not all that good, I should be in for $1,000 only because I don't want to lose to the player on my left on average, right? So you want to have more chips than the players on your right, which to some extent implies you want to have fewer chips or at least enough to cover the player on your right, but you want to have fewer chips than the player on your left. Also, chips flow to good players on average. So you wanna have more chips than the worst players. Let's take a look at some examples. How much should you buy in for in this example? Um, imagine this is a poker table. This is like say under the gun, under the gun plus one, low jack, high jack, big blind, small blind, button, whatever. So here we are, middle position. The players to our left have 200 big blinds. The players to our right have 100 big blinds. How much should we buy in for? Well, very clearly, 100 big blinds because we want to have enough to cover the players on our right, which is 100 big blinds. And that's all we want to have because we are going to be losing chips on average to these players. Many players, though, if the table maximum is 200 big blinds, they'll just automatically buy in for 200 big blinds. And that is a mistake. It's a big mistake. It's a detrimental mistake. That'll make it actually perhaps difficult for you to win. You want to have more chips than the players on your right, and that's all. Here's a more normal way the table may be laid out. Imagine we're in this scenario. How much should we buy in for? Assuming we are better than our opponents. Well, we want to have more chips than the players on our right. These players have roughly the same. This is a spot where I'm definitely going to be in for 200 big blinds if I think I'm better than my opponent because I want to have this player in particular, the player to my direct right, covered. Also, the player on my direct left does not have 200 big blinds, which is good. So I'm going to be winning 200 big blinds on average from this player and losing 100 big blinds on average to this player. Maybe on average is not the right term. When I play a big pot, I want it to be for 200 big blinds against the player on my right because I'm going to be winning proportionally more of those big pots. What if instead this player was world class? Should that change anything? We have a world class player here. Should we now buy in for only 100? Probably not. Why? Because we're still in position on this player. What if instead this player is world class? Should that change our 200 big blind strategy? Um, probably not. This is still probably fine. If we have this set up though, make this 200 big blinds and give this player world class as well, we're going to want to be in for 100 now, assuming these players all play normally. Two strong players, 200 big blinds deep on your direct left, especially if you like put 100 here. This is definitely a spot to buy in for 100. A lot of people though, they go back to having ego problems. They think, I need to buy in for the maximum. I need to have everybody covered. Get all of that nonsense out of your head, okay? 
Let's discuss when to quit for the day. The time to quit this video has been pretty long. All right, you need to have a plan in place for when you should quit each and every session. Okay, you need to know when you're going to leave before you start within reason. I recommend that most players have a stop loss. A stop loss means that whenever you lose this amount of money or big blinds, they're going to be done. You're quitting no matter how or why. And the reason for that is because most players are prone to tilt, even if they don't know they're prone to tilt. A lot of the best players in the world, they don't spew away their money when they're on tilt, but they play a little bit too tightly, a little bit too cautiously. And that's enough to crush their win rate. So I would recommend most people quit for the day when they're down something like three buy-ins. Maybe fewer buy-ins if you play super deep stack games, maybe more buy-ins if you play super shallow stack games. When I used to play five to no limit, I thought I have a very, very good, strong mindset. I don't think I really go on tilt so much. I think I play well most of the time. But if I lost 450 big blinds, $4,500, for any reason whatsoever, I would quit for the day. In that game, you can only buy in for 1,500. So that was three buy-ins at five to no limit. If I lost 4,500, I was done. Not because I'm mad and angry and I think the game's rigged, but because I do not trust myself to play perfect poker after losing 450 big blinds. Also, it is worth noting, on average, when you are losing, it implies the game is perhaps slightly tougher than normal because you lose when the game is tougher than normal, right? Makes sense. Maybe we do not have the edge that we think we have for whatever reason. Maybe I have a default strategy of continuation betting a lot because I think most players fold too often. But what if I just happen to randomly run into a player who just doesn't fold too often? Well, now they're counter exploiting me by accident just because that's how they play, right? So maybe my win rate is not what I think I have on that particular day for whatever reason. Or maybe I'm just running badly. Or maybe I'm playing poorly. Who knows, right? But I think having the stop loss will go a long way to ensuring you do not play in bad games where you're lacking an edge, which I think is kind of important. Yeah, your butt's not in the seat and you're not playing, but I think that is okay when things are going especially poorly. Now, you need to be able to go home, go to bed, study, recuperate, get right back in the action the next day. Don't be a baby and think, okay, I lost three days in a row, so I should quit, or I should take a vacation, or I should take a week off. I think that kind of thing will uh, essentially result in you just not playing all that much. And if, again, if you don't play, you don't make money. Of course, though, you want to make sure you're playing with an edge. If you lose 450 big blinds five days in a row, you may need to move down. The nice thing about moving down is it lets you play against weaker players, which means you're more likely to have an edge. Now, when you're winning... Do not quit within reason. When you are winning, it implies the game is soft. If the game is softer than normal, your win rate is higher than normal on average. If your win rate is higher than normal on average, don't quit. Now, what I would do back in the day is that I would quit whenever I lost 450 big blinds or after 12 hours. I would typically start at noon and play till about midnight, which is actually not the ideal time to play poker. You'd probably rather play 8 p.m. until 8 a.m. or something like that, because that's when people are more inclined to gamble. People typically gamble more at night than they do in the middle of the day. I cared about having very good life balance to where I'm awake during regular person hours. That said, if all you care about is winning money, that should not really be a concern for you. So why would I quit after 12 hours? I know that I do not focus especially well whenever I'm tired. I always make a point to be very well rested. And I know after like 14 or 16 hours, I stop paying attention all that well. If you stop paying attention all that well, some of your edge is going to go away. Also, if you play for, let's say, 24 hours, now you're going to need more off time to recuperate. Whereas I could show up and play 12 hours a day every day. And I, and I literally did. I did not take off days. So... I would quit after 12 hours. I would recommend most people probably quit before that, like eight hours, maybe maybe even less. Um, so yeah, have a plan in place for when to quit. I would, however, stay late longer than 12 hours every once in a while when the game was especially amazing. When's the game especially amazing? Usually when two or three players at my table are just throwing an absolute circus. They're, they're all in every hand, they're going nuts, they're putting your money in, drawing dead, whatever. If you're sitting at an absolute circus of a table, your win rate may be 40 big blinds per hour or something ridiculous. I played in games where I can guarantee you my win rate was like that, through the roof. 
if you find yourself at one of these tables, which would happen to me maybe like once a month when I used to grind every day, I'm just not quitting. I will put in a long session if I expect to have a gigantic win rate. Because if you think about it, if you think you're winning like 40 big blinds per hour, if your normal win rate is, let's say, eight big blinds per hour, but you're playing with such horrible players who are literally giving it away, you're making five times as much. That's amazing overtime pay. If you're going to get paid five times as much to play, you should probably sit there and play another eight hours or whatever. Realize, though, you'll probably play a little bit worse. That said, maybe your adrenaline will be going. Adrenaline will be going because you will uh, you'll be in such a great spot. So anyway, have a plan for when you plan to quit each day. That's going to go a long way to ensuring that you are playing in games that you can beat. So again, that's it. All you have to do to win at poker, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. If you do, those three things you will win. If you do not, you will lose. And I hope this video has gone a long way to teaching you lots and lots and lots about cash game bankroll management. If you enjoyed today's video, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below. Click the notification bell. If you have a de super degen friend, show them this video. It's probably far too long for them if they're super degen, but maybe just show them uh, this slide and say, do this. And if they do this, assuming they have a positive win rate, they're gonna be way better off than if they don't. Good luck, have fun, stay disciplined. And do these three things because I want you to have long-term success. I'll talk to you next time.